I mean, throughout our industry, we've gotten those pilots largely from the military or they've worked their way up through the regionals and it's taken a long time. And by the time they show up, they've got thousands of hours. And we've got more and more cases today where ab initio flight training schools will bring a pilot to the flight deck with only several hundred hours, not several thousand hours. And they're largely pilots that have probably learned on um, something other than what you and I might have learned on. So they're not up in super cubs doing, you know, all the stick and rudder stuff we got to do as kids. So they don't have the same, necessarily the same reserve aeronautical knowledge that people used to have when they showed up in a flight deck. And a lot of that reserve knowledge has led to the level of safety that we have today. Boeing has had a philosophy, this, this goes to the old Boeing Airbus thing because they create an envelope. Boeing has always had a philosophy of giving the pilot every tool they can muster if they need it. Yes. They have full authority to make that airplane do what they need to do. Yes, that's right. That's right. Does this run, con I know you were answered, asked that question at our meeting last week, but does this, how does this line up with autonomous flight? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question, and, and we're thinking hard about that today. And I would back up the, I'd back up one step from the pilot as the final authority and think about what are the, what are the assumptions that are made when we make a statement like the pilot is the final authority? Some of those assumptions may be that the pilot has thousands of hours of training, thousands of hours of manual flight, good stick and rudder capability, a, a lot of reserve aeronautical knowledge. If, and this is an if, if that's no longer the case 20 years from now, is the assumption still valid? Um, do we always know that uh, a pilot will be able to take advantage of all of the high angle of attack capability of an airplane if the pilot has never flown at the edges of high angle of attack. The corollary to that is, if in the past our accidents have been largely a result of controlled flight into terrain or um, trying to avoid another aircraft in the air and um, enhanced ground proximity warning systems and traffic collision avoidance systems have eliminated those as major causes of accidents, then maybe the requirement for all of the high alpha capability of an airplane is no longer there. And so I, I think not just about is the pilot the final authority, I think about, and we collectively, it's not me, it's the experts, yeah. we think about what are the assumptions about when that performance is needed today versus yesterday versus 20 years from now? And what are our assumptions about the pilot's ability to use that capability 10 years ago, today, and 20 years from now? It might be the same and it might change. What we're speculating is that um, we want to understand the technology so that if those assumptions change, we're ready to, to go forward in that other state. So the other state being Autonomous more, yes. more autonomous. Uh, auto more autonomous. What, if, if we can sum up the problem this way, you're looking at it. We know because of the, the list you've given, like like enhanced ground procs, which is something I've done a lot with directly with Honeywell, has eliminated with planes equipped the most common form of crash that we have had for generations. It's just wiped it out. That's right. Um, now, but with, I think you had a figure, what, a million and a half pilots over the next 40 years, yes. something like that, yes. that we're going to need. Yes. Define as, is in, in, I mean, we live in a world of sound bites in our business. Define as concisely as you can what the problem is you are looking to explore to solve. Um, ra rather than saying what the problem is, I'll say it this way. There's the potential for that group of pilots of that group of million and a half pilots 20 years from now to not have the same level of proficiency and reserve experience as the pilots of today. If that's the case, if that's the case, then we need to be ready with a technical solution to ensure that the overall level of safety of the industry is maintained. And these might be razor thin margins that we're talking about. So we're talking, it seems like the range of options are from cockpits with one pilot versus two, cockpits with no pilots at all. What are, what are, so what, what are sort of the, the branches of this that we could end up going down if we choose to go down them at all? 
Yeah, there, I mean, there are several steps that could get you from point A to point B. If point A is what we have today and point B is fully autonomous aircraft, um, the steps could be something along the lines of reduced augmented crew and crews. So today when you have a, a 16 hour long haul flight, you might have five pilots operating the airplane taking turns during that 16 hours. It could be that autonomy is a decision making enabler that allows you to do something with do with something less than five pilots during that 16 hour segment. It could be that it's something that allows you to have single pilot cruise operation for cargo operation, for example. Or it could be something that allows you to move single pilot operation from really small air cargo airplanes up to larger airplanes today. And as, as you know, Cessna caravans are, as an example, you know, it's a, it's a, a 10 passenger, one pilot airplane that operates with a single pilot and carries passengers in charter operation all the time. And who's to say that an uh, uh, airplane carrying cargo couldn't be made to be bigger than that? Um, and so I think there's just a there's a there's a series of steps, each of wi which is worth exploring as we're trying to ensure that we have the same level of safety and integrity and economics. Because I want to be careful here. You're not saying we're going to build an autonomous airplane. No. What is it you're saying? What I'm saying is we're exploring the building blocks to understand first if it's technically feasible, second if it's responsible. And third, if it's something that we need to do as an imperative. It's really those three things. When you look out there, the, the accident, and I brought this up at our last meeting, that seems to, I mean, you're basically, part of this would be looking at software, looking at algorithms, looking at computers that can make decisions. Right. So I take right. it it's probably fairly easy with sensor technology to go to an auto land with nobody in the controls and then if an airplane were to roll out and we can have airplanes talk to each other that's I mean that was kind of the fundamentals of TCAS sure. is is you can you can have that then you have a situation like the miracle on the Hudson which would seem to defy all how could you design an algorithm that would include all of the elements involved right 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 yeah yeah, and that's, a, and that's, I would say that the work we're doing with some of the early building blocks is to try to understand some of the questions that would lead you to that kind of a capability. An example, you bring up a good example of an auto land. Right now, an auto land can be called off by the airplane in the event of failures on the airplane. So the, the airplane in a, what we call triple channel coupled approach, um, that could be broken off if you lose the radar altimeter or one or two of the radar altimeters. If you lose certain airplane capability, um, but if another airplane crosses the runway, the airplane on approach doesn't know anything or do anything about it. The flight crew has to intervene. If you know, if uh, if a pilot on the ground loses orientation and against or a controller puts an airplane where it shouldn't be, and an, aer and an airplane crosses the runway. The airplane on approach doesn't know that, but the pilot does. So we clearly rely on the pilot for that. There's several ways that you can approach that problem. One might be to have the TCAS systems on the airplane or ADSB in and out um, coordinate the knowledge of the positions of those two airplanes relative to one another. Now, can it do that to 10 to the minus ninth so we know it always does it right all the time? There are a couple of different ways to do that. And it may be that one of the best ways to do that is to use a camera and artificial intelligence to scour the airplane, the area in front of the airplane, and to make a decision about whether something has just entered the runway or not, and use that to augment the ADS-B capability of the airplanes. That's, that's an example of the kind of thing you might want to use artificial intelligence in. So you've got a deterministic system, which is the ADS-B, or TCAS, or whatever system exists today, and then you've got a non-deterministic decision-making capability that's kind of overseeing the action of those deterministic machines. That's an example that I could think of, of how you might start down this path of understanding machine learning as applied to decision-making on the cockpit. Is there a time frame? Is there a, and, and I'm not expecting an answer like, well, by 2050, we need to be here and here. Maybe there is, if there is, tell me, but I didn't get that sense 
from last week. Yeah. What is it that we're trying to do? Where do we think we need to be by when, whether it's, it's to do this or not to do this or to do this to what level? Um, I would I'd describe it this way, and I haven't thought about that real hard, but I would describe it this way. I would say that the development of the technology and the capability needs to be such that it doesn't hinder the growth of the industry at the level of safety that we have today.